There's real power in feminine woman. It's not putting us beneath. There's actual real power behind being a feminine woman, more than most women have any idea. She had a good positive outlook on things. She could have easily been very depressed and sad and kind of entered into this victim kind of slave mode. And she didn't. She kind of made the best of her life. That, that, was, that was just magical for him. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Fascinating Womanhood channel, where we talk about all things that have to do with developing femininity and building strong, long-lasting, loving relationships. I am Cherry Lynn, and I'm here with my mom, Dixie Andalyn Forsyth. Hi. Hi. So we are here today as part of our Disney Princess series. This is our fourth one. And just a little background, we're doing this because a lot of our ladies really love Fascinating Womanhood principles. They love our books but they kind of want some more visual examples and how to apply it to their lives. And we thought it would be fun to do it with Disney princesses. Because they're not real people, so they don't really have any faults that are not shown on the screen. So we're actually having a lot of fun and we, we hope that okay. you're having fun watching these. Today we are doing Tangled, <laughs> which is Rapunzel. It's a story. I've never really understood why they didn't call it Rapunzel and not. And they call uh, it maybe Tangled. it's because maybe it's like a Hans Christian Andersen thing. Maybe it has a trademark. And I know there's a lot of different stories of Rapunzel and we're just covering Tangled because it's the Disney one and we're just trying to follow along with Disney. And one of the other reasons why we're doing this is because I have a three-year-old daughter that has been watching all of these. So it kind of worked hand in hand with what we were doing with Fascinating Women and so. So what we do in these Disney princess videos is we go through the movie, not necessarily in order, but we highlight the fascinating womanhood principles that we see best shown in the movie. Mm -hmm. Usually it's about four or five that we see that kind of dominate the topic. And so, a few cringy moments. Yes. And then we cover just some things that just didn't feel right. Don't really go with fascinating womanhood. Just a few. We had a lot of principles in this movie. There were a ton of them. So we're going to go through those first and just name them off. What we noticed in this movie was girlishness, character, understanding men, feminine influence, domestic goddess, and the upstairs downstairs concept. Which is from my book, Timeless. So yeah. So if you don't know what we're talking about and you're watching this and you maybe aren't familiar, we have a lot of books specifically in this movie. We're talking a lot about fascinating womanhood for the timeless woman. So if you haven't read that book, to where, where all the places you can find that book are linked down below the video. So what did you think of Tangled? I know you haven't really watched it. Like I no, yeah, it was a newer one. I hadn't really watched it. I thought it was interesting how varied from the original story is very creative. Uh, the idea of her hair being magic was new. It wasn't in the original, uh, but, but it was interesting. I was surprised that they had the love interest was a thief. <laughs> I thought... I thought he would be more of like a prince, but he wasn't. He was a thief yeah. that was kind of a diamond in the rough. It's kind of similar to Aladdin in a way, uh, <laughs> which is weird. And we're doing that one soon. So I'm kind of like thinking of it in my head, but it's similar to that, except for at the end, he doesn't become, well, I guess he kind of becomes a prince because he marries her. Rapunzel definitely demonstrates girlishness, I think. Yeah. Probably more than any other Disney princess that we've covered so far. And she has just so many different things that she shows in the movies. This is this has a lot of examples in it, like you yeah. said. This is a really extra, extra detailed video because it's my my daughter's favorite. So I've seen it. Just, just watched it. So many times. Like I've seen yeah. Frozen so many times. I've seen all these movies so many. But Tangled is her absolute favorite. So. But see, for me, I've seen it like once. So yeah. you know it yeah. better than I do. So I know like the back of my head. Okay. Yeah. So the first one was that we mentioned was girlishness. The way she says things, you know, I have a prisoner in my closet. I've got a person in my closet. The way she says it, like, oh my goodness. And she this is somebody who's never really outside her quote mother, who was actually her abductor, hasn't seen anyone in her whole life. Yeah, and, and in that scene, she's looking at herself in the mirror like, I got a prisoner. I'm like, well, like she was proud of herself. Yeah, she's she's really proud, proud of herself. She was, yeah. uh, she's just so girly the whole movie. I love the how she like knocks herself in the head with the frying pan, right? As she's trying to look all <laughs> proud of herself. It's like, oops. <laughs> in, the, in the first part where she keeps hitting him with a frying pan, I thought she could actually kill him, but this is a Disney movie, so she, right. she keeps knocking you know, him. It's kind of painful to watch the, those scenes where she hits him because I'm just like, ow, so much damage. Yeah, head, <laughs> my head trauma. <laughs> anyway, yeah. And when she pouts and says to Eugene, who goes by Flynn, that's his sort of yeah. alter ego, he says, now you'll never find it, meaning the, the satchel has a crown in it that he stole. Now it's hidden where you'll never find it. 
Well, she put it, she put it in that pot that was so obvious. obviously right there. And he was like, it's in that pot, isn't it? And she's like, now it's in a place where you'll never find it. She's <laughs> kind of like dramatic and serious. Yeah. And she's trying to be in that whole scene where she first meet, first meets him. She was trying so hard to be intimidating. So what do you want with my hair? She wanted to like defend herself, but she actually, and she did a good job actually, but but he kind of thought she was adorable almost immediately because he was just like, what, sure. what is she sure. doing? Who are you? And how did you find me? Aha. Uh -huh. And I'm sure she was taught not to trust anyone. But there's no way her stepmother or her, her mother that was taking care of her, there's no way she taught her to be feminine and girly because she no. was feminine and girly. She was evil and horrible. Horrible. And her. So where did Rapunzel learn how to do all these things? You know, we talk in Fascinating Womanhood about well, is girlishness really me? And I just think it's interesting in that movie how she is portrayed as just naturally girly. No one taught her any of those things. You know, some people think that if you're girlish, that it's something you're just born that way, like apparently this character was. But I remember, remember years ago reading a book. Some people are born with the ability to see things and be able to draw them by the way, because they know how to look at them. But yeah. other people can learn to do that. And, and this book said that it's called Drawing on the Right Side of Your Brain, yeah. I think. But it said that anyone can learn to draw or paint well enough to make money at it. But some people have to learn and others kind of just pick it up. So yeah. I think if some of these principles are like that. Some people naturally are really girly and others learn it. And it doesn't really matter. It's, it's a part of all of us because we're, we're females, because we're women. That's really, really well. I like that. That's a good analogy too. I also love the part where she says, this is all the scene when she first meets Eugene for the first time. Who else knows my location? Who else knows my location? <laughs> oh, but he goes, what? <laughs> he doesn't even know who she is. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just love that whole scene where she's just being so, uh, <laughs> she goes, what do you want to do with my hair? He's like, what? <laughs> so... What do you want with my hair? To cut it? What? Sell it? No! <laughs> just, it was just funny. Well, and, and he doesn't know she's a princess. He, he just, has no idea of anything. That he just thinks she's kind of nuts. But he, he definitely, if you'll notice, he thinks she's really cute. And he actually kind of tries to flirt with her a little bit. And she doesn't understand. And then he gets annoyed with her. And then he kind of wants to get rid of her. And it isn't until later in the movie, we can talk, we're, I don't want to jump ahead, it isn't until later in the movie where he actually falls in love with her, with her and we can point out some of the steps that lead up to him falling in love with her. Well, and it's kind of neat. Unlike some of the other Disney princess movies, he learns to love her. He doesn't love at first sight, like snow, right. you know, and sleeping. Well, and, and, and he falls in love with her because of a series of events that he sees. And I, I mean, to be frank, a lot of fascinating womanhood things that he sees. And I know that Disney doesn't know what fascinating woman it is but yeah, right. that's how that's how simple these principles are they're everywhere and you don't really notice them and that's what i love about doing these with movies and she she demonstrates a lot of these these principles and he falls in love with her so it's just kind of perfect yeah, if you're um, i think just a side note i think the script was written by a couple of men oh was it yeah i think so i looked at the credits now i could we've watched so many disney movies but i'm pretty sure this is is written by two men so almost uh, all of the Disney princesses, men were heavily involved in the creation of them, which is very interesting. If you think well, about they it. know what they know what they like. They know what they want. Well, and girls like it too. So and like in all of the Disney movies, uh, the princesses are all, are always really kind to animals. Yeah, well, and that's in the under the girlishness notes is the way she is with Pascal and how she kind of is cute with him and treats him like her little buddy. She talks to him and she's Pascal so gentle. Pascal is like, what is he, a chameleon? Yeah, he's a chameleon. He's a chameleon. Yeah. yeah. Also, the scene where she first leaves the tower for the very, very first oh, time. Oh, yeah. Touches the grass. She touches the grass with her bare feet. And just she's just so cute how she's like, this is the best day ever. Best day ever. Like the girlish joy there is just so, I mean, it's exaggerated. And I, I know she's young, but it's just so cute. And it shows such an innocent side of girlishness. And I just love that. And it's my daughter's favorite scene. I know people who retain that girlish joy no matter what their age. Uh, yeah. And just are that way. It's their personality. I think it's really cute. Well, even just having a moment of that when you just genuinely feel happy, it's okay. You know, I think some women kind of try to not, they don't want to display that. They might be embarrassed to act that way. 
yeah it's okay if you feel like it's genuine and it's you're feeling happy i love that part i think also throughout the entire movie her talking to herself constantly is super girly little it's a mm-hmm. kind of a innocent cute thing that's okay i mean what she doesn't know won't kill her right and now if she were to do it in kind of a strange way and an obsessive way that wouldn't be cute but she does it in a really cute way talking to herself yeah, well, innocent one. <laughs> yeah. And the way she is with those other criminals those thugs the yeah. ruffians, <laughs> the ruffian, yeah, and they look really scary. They're huge and peg leg and all that. And she she doesn't seem terribly intimidated by them. She does it first when she sees them, and she climbs onto Eugene's back and hides. And if you'll notice, he starts to warm up to her a little bit more in that scene right mm-hmm. after she climbs on his back. He she shows she inspires his masculinity a little bit right there, and he kind of has this hmm, you know, she's okay, she's not that bad. Uh, Because he didn't like her before that scene. She kind of needed him there, which was, which was brought out his masculinity. And then the last one for girlishness is just that scene when she's in the the tavern. It's like a, it's like a tavern full of criminals. And she says, haven't any of you ever had a dream? (laughs) Have any of you ever had a dream? (laughs) It's like that one guy said, yes, he wanted to be a concert. I had a dream once. Well, then she, I mean, this is so exaggerated. It's just a cartoon. It's a very endearing scene that she is able to get those men, those criminals, to sing with her and tell them their dreams. It's a metaphor of what fascinating woman can do. If yeah. you be this feminine woman and have this, she had such amazing feminine influence on those men and she didn't even mean to. She got yeah. them all singing and, and they were like, I got a dream. And it turns into this big thing. And it's just, I think little kids are watching that and going, huh? But as an adult, you know, I, I'm watching that scene and I'm thinking, oh, you know, she's, she's really, she's got some, some power over these men. Without and hardly she's anything. not totally aware of it either. No. The next quality is character. And she can see past, once she gets over her being afraid of Eugene, she can see his, he's deeper than this thief that she first sees in him. And she can just kind of tell that he's not really a bad person. She is being told her entire life that basically everyone in the outside world is not to be trusted. And instead of going with that, she allows herself to make that judgment based on spending some time with him. And I think that's great that she was able to rule him out okay he's not a bad guy he's not a rat as we say in fascinating woman and he's actually showing me signs that there's a lot of goodness there and that just shows a lot about her character she right. easily judged him like you said well she didn't trust him immediately but then she shouldn't have because she didn't really know him well she just looked for the bright side in mm-hmm. everything um mm-hmm. even being in locked away in that tower she just she kind of seem to be happy she's still like I, you know i don't want to go outside i like it in here you know part of that's kind of sad but but part of it is is showing that she had a good positive outlook on things she could have easily been very depressed and sad and kind of entered into this victim kind of slave mode and she didn't she kind of made the best of her life which well, she really she awesome. maintained hope in her future she didn't feel like she would always be there in the yeah. tower well she saw people so well too i love that scene in the tavern where she says in the song, it's actually part of a song. She says, like all you lovely folks, I've got a dream. Like all you lovely folks, I've got a dream. Lovely folks. <laughs> and they were very lovely, but yeah, they that's what- They were all criminals, but- <laughs> They're all criminals. They all look like they have one eye knocked out and hardly any teeth. <laughs> it's just kind of sweet that she said, you know, that you're lovely folks. Like that was a kind thing for her to do. And in yeah, turn, those cute. guys wanted to protect her and those guys wanted to- to help her and take care of her. It's sweet. Well, also the way she treats, we keep saying her mother, but it wasn't really her mother, her captor who said she's her mother. Uh, the way she treats her, she's very respectful, even though this mother figure is not really good to her. She'll say, I love you so much, but then she she gets real cold and just says you can never go out ever. But she's always very uh, respectful. Yeah, her mom was horrible. She could have just easily turned on her and argued with her. And she was a smart girl and she obviously could have just taken taken advantage of that but she didn't well when you see in the show how she leaves the tower she could have left anytime she wanted with that hair of hers but she didn't she was she obeyed the rules another part of her character that i think is is great in comparison with other disney princesses is that at the end she did stand up for herself she did yeah whereas cinderella and and some of the others cinderella stands out the most they 
kind of were abused and they didn't really do anything about it at the end. Maybe it wasn't the smartest thing that she did and the things that she said, but she did stand up for herself and say, I'm never, I'm going to fight you to the end. I will never stop trying to get away from you. I thought that was great. That shows that she has a good, good self-esteem. And- yeah. Sleeping Beauty, she didn't really get an opportunity to stand up to anyone. Well, if you compare, you know, Rapunzel to Cinderella, they had a lot of similarities in that they were kind of both slaves in a way, mm-hmm. kind of. I mean, Cinderella obviously wasn't living under a lie like Rapunzel was, but they both were kind of stuck. Rapunzel actually did stand up for herself in the end. So that's, that's something to be said about the character that was written for her. Yeah, that's right. Next one is feminine influence. The first thing in that is the way she got the guys in the tavern who were really tough at first and she influenced them and they ended up kind of protecting her and liking her. Yeah. The way they swung her around and, and she, she's real, she was kind to them. Well, what she did is she came into that tavern. She kind of observed what was around her and she wasn't afraid anymore because based on what she saw, because she just didn't feel danger anymore. And she started to talk to them a little bit. And then that's when the song broke out and she basically befriended them. And because she was so gentle and kind and she got them to open up, she, she got these guys to just open up to her somehow. And she had no idea that they would end up helping her. So go live your dream. And she didn't, yeah, she didn't manipulate anybody. She just. She just, that's just how she was. I love how she used her hair as a weapon throughout. Yeah, I know how, how good she was at it. I thought, well, she would have had tons of time to practice in that tower. She didn't hardly have anything to do. She well, was like a lasso. It's such a lovely, I know it's a fantasy, but it's a lovely metaphor of like her hair being her weapon. Like, it's like, oh, it's like feminine. It's like this feminine weapon. It's so cute that they, that they wrote that in. And I know it's not possible, but there's a metaphor to how feminine she was and how, uh, she was able to fight with her hair like that and still remain not only strong, but feminine at the same time. Well, and the frying pan, which <laughs> frying pan. <laughs> which looked like it was cast iron. So those are pretty I heavy. Yeah. I know. I love the part where she says, thanks for everything to the guy. Thanks for everything. The fat guy. And she, oh yeah, that was really cute. Cheek and he blushes. It's just so cute. Cinderella did that. She kissed her, her father at the end it's so cute and they it's yeah. kind of like the two things kind of connect to each other i love it the horse yeah, was surprised me because the horse acted more like a dog sit what now drop the boot <laughs> drop it i know it's weird it's so yeah. strange but the horse was an interesting part of the I, I know i mean i guess it's supposed to be a boy but she he was uh, rude he was like a rude horse <laughs> and she gentled him she even she gentled, gentled him, him. And, hey boy, easy. Easy. and he ends up saving her too and you know what she said to gentle him she just looked for the good in him like we keep saying over and over again and she said oh he's nothing but a big sweetheart oh he's nothing but a big sweetheart because <laughs> eugene had said yeah, that's that, she that said. horse was horrible <laughs> the horse was so grumpy the whole movie and that scene is like pivotal point in that scene because the horse after that it's just there to protect her. Nobody appreciates you, do they? Do they? And he ends up kind of protecting Eugene, too. I mean, he, not just he her. And he, but the horse was really mad most of the movie. But, you know, you could see in Eugene's face when she gentles the guy that's in the tavern, she gentles the horse. I think there's a scene where she's dancing in the village and he, he just, you keep seeing him change the way he's looking at her. It's like you can see their relationship developing Uh it's a series of events that she does and he's watching it's really it's done really well if you can pick up on it i don't think little girls are picking up on it but not really (laughs) not not in that detail and then for her influence that moment when they're about to drown and the humility that she has when she realizes that they're about to die and she said instead of blaming him which i'm sure a lot of women would do and even some disney princesses especially in modern day would probably blame the man cuz he kind of did put them in there if you think about it she said i'm so sorry flynn I'm so i'm so sorry flynn <laughs> and she just cries and she's just genuinely so sorry for getting them in that hole he that's when he opens up and she apologizes for dragging him on her journey to see the stars and it's just like it's so sad 
Well, she just thought she was going to see those stars, which is like just a for fun thing. It was she didn't know it had any kind of a important meaning to it. She didn't know it was really about her birthday. And she didn't apologize because she was trying to manipulate him into feeling sorry for her. She said, I'm so sorry. And this is all my fault because she genuinely felt bad for the part that she played. You can also see in that scene that he just falls for her in that moment. Upstairs, downstairs. <laughs> now this is about being in the upstairs part of your mind versus the, the downstairs or basement where everything is like what ifs, fears, all that stuff. So that's part of uh, Timeless, the book. She isn't downstairs very much. She isn't negative very much. But she, you, when she goes to war with herself, she is. You know, I can't help but notice you seem a little at war with yourself here. And she, she verbalizes, of course, the audience has to hear what she's thinking. Uh, over her choice whether to leave or not, because her mother told her not to, her supposed mother. What I think is interesting with the upstairs downstairs concept, I think you see this all the time in almost every movie. You can see it all over the place. But in this, since we're talking about Disney, in this particular movie, you see it quickly. That's what I think is interesting about it, is that she goes downstairs and like you've always said, you just like slide downstairs. Yeah, you go downstairs like so a virtual, fast. It's like a virtual fire pole. You're down there. Yeah, and, and this is like a, a a cartoon version of that. So she's got this scene where she first gets out of the tower and she's so excited to finally leave a place she's been stuck in for years. And she goes to war with herself. I am a horrible daughter. I'm going back. despicable human being she's literally like rolling on the floor and talking to herself and saying i'm a horrible person and she's literally just slides downstairs and nobody is at fault for that but her it's just a demon in her mind we all have those we've all had those moments where we oh what have i done or what you know i'm worthless or whatever she has those and she shows them in the movie and then a few seconds later she's back up again this is Mm -hmm. And it's just interesting to see that portrayed in a cartoon. I mean, it's a, it's a simple version of what you're talking about. She, this isn't just a cartoon. I know people yeah. who, who are like this and it's actually very endearing. She, somehow she intuitively learned how to get back upstairs and she's upstairs the majority of the movie, but yeah. it's interesting to see her hills and valleys of it that you see so much. And she, you actually get to hear her talking to herself and saying some poor self-talk i am a horrible daughter she has yeah. some more things that she's saying to herself and it's it's just surprising you don't see disney princesses saying like what is wrong with me you know you don't you don't see that no. in any of the other movies there's another scene where she's uh downstairs she's terrified on the canoe right out after having that amazing day with eugene and she starts to suddenly worry about her mother again you okay i'm terrified and it's so interesting the whole movie, she goes downstairs when she thinks about her mother. She knows that mother's going to be furious with her. And she, but her mother doesn't intimidate her in a way that inspires her. It take, thinking of her mother takes her downstairs, which is kind of that symbol of like abuse in a toxic relationship. And she goes downstairs every time she thinks of her mother or something reminds her of her mother. Uh, but then she suddenly goes back upstairs when she's talking to Eugene. You get to go find a new dream. That's true. It's cute. It's a cute little tiny thing that I noticed. And then that song, uh, which I love. I love that song on the canoe. At last I see it's the a light. sweet song. Uh, the words. The words of the song, At Last I See the Light. It's all about getting upstairs. That song, if you listen to all the words, the, all the words are about both of them going upstairs. It says, all at once, everything looks different now that I see you. And I know it's supposed to be more of a love song, but both of them were essentially downstairs. He was a thief. She was kind of a slave. And in that song, they both realize that each other helps them to kind of see positive things in life. Really and it just happens to be a real pretty song, too. Well, and not a lot of the Disney guys get great songs. I know Aladdin and Jasmine did. and like, But sometimes the guys are kind of the background. And it's cute that they're both kind of representing a team in that moment. They're, mm -hmm. they're both saying that each other is, is number one in a sense, and each other is inspiring each other. It's not just like the man rescues the girl or the girl is singing about how in love she is. And the guy's just kind of, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's like, they're both kind of equally both, yeah, participating. 
Yeah, I love that. I love that. The next one is understanding men specifically relating to melting walls. I know melting walls is something we've talked about in a lot of our videos. I don't because think we have a wall, naturally have a wall of reserve, even really healthy men do. It's just how thick it is depends on their experiences in their life prior to meeting you or uh, even after you met them. But a lot of things happen during childhood, just in the course of their life, uh, even if they have really good family that men develop uh, sometimes very thick walls to protect themselves because they are sensitive. They just act like they're not. In Fascinating Women, we teach that he has to bring down his own wall. We don't have the power to do that, but we sometimes we do help him to melt those walls. Yeah, and, and if you want to learn a little bit more about the the wall and what, what we're talking about, you definitely need to read Fascinating Womanhood for the Timeless Woman. That's going to go into it a little bit deeper. But essentially, we can just call the wall as like a wall of pride and um, protection, protection. Yeah. Now, walls are, are meant to protect and protect his, his ego. Protect your emotions, protect yeah. you're kind of, you're kind of hiding behind it. The men are, men are kind of hiding behind it. So in this movie, again, going back to that, that song, going back to the song we were just talking about the words in there where he says, now that she's here, it's crystal clear. I am where I'm meant to be. The world has somehow shifted. That's all about how he's singing about her understanding him. She understands him and she is bringing his guard down and she's bringing that wall down and he's singing about it. And if you, if you watch the movie and pay attention to all the things that she does and some of, some of the things that we've just discussed, that's that point where he realizes that she has done that and she didn't mean to do it. It wasn't, well, no, she just, she just naturally that way. And then, and then when she asked him about his life and he actually tells her his real name because yeah. his, even his supposed partners in crime don't know his real name. Eugene. What? My real name is Eugene Fitzherbert. Yeah, that was the first step. Ultimately, all those things ended up helping him melt his own wall, which was really right. lovely. Right. You don't see that in a lot of Disney movies. And she's interested in his past. And she ends up saying, I like, I like the real you better than the uh, persona. The fugitive. For the record, I like Eugene Fitzherbert much better than Flynn Rider. Well, then you'd be the first. She likes him. She likes who he is, and that he really is. all even more. <laughs> that, that was that was just magical for him. Then getting everyone in town to dance, including him, that was such a, a feminine influence, but a, a, a way that she was able to understand him. She was able to. I mean, he think about it. He was in this town where he was a fugitive and he was looking around. Well, he, was wanted. he was what? wanted. He was wanted. It's like there was a warrant right. after his arrest there. And and she got him to get out there and dance. It made it look like it was all day. She somehow influenced him to just come down a notch and he became so much more open and himself. And that's when you start to see him be himself more. And it's interesting. He really isn't, doesn't want to be a fugitive. He doesn't want to be a thief. You don't see it really until the, some of those later scenes. And then she trusts him with the satchel. And, and for those who may have not seen it or only seen it once, like me, you, the satchel <laughs> has a crown in it that they stole from the palace. Was it the princess's crown? It was her crown, which is That's so ironic. That's what I thought. <laughs> her crown. But she lets him take it off into the dark. Okay. And he actually doesn't come back with it, but it's not his fault. But what's lovely about that scene is that you see in her eyes, she just thinks, oh boy, I'm going to let him take it. I'm going to trust him and he's going to take it into the dark and disappear and I'm going to be alone. And he doesn't forget that later. In fact, it makes him even closer to her because she not only says, oh my gosh, you're a fugitive. Oh my gosh, your name's you, you know, Eugene. You're not really Flynn. I'm also going to trust you. <laughs> it's like, she just does so many things to make him feel like, like masculine yeah yeah she sees the best in him okay and then the last one is the domestic goddess you notice that all of the i think all of the princesses are good at domestic goddess are they is there any are there any that are really messy i don't think so are there well it's not necessarily about messy it's more about is it is it demonstrated in the movie like princess jasmine she never cooks she doesn't have well, she, she doesn't have to do anything. it would only be the ones that are kind of put in that position but none of them are just like they don't care uh, true but but in entangled she does so much she can do so much 
Mm-hmm. She does, not only does she do everything really, really well, it looks like, but she does it with a smile. There's literally a scene where she's dusting off a candlestick and she's yeah. smiling and it's so sad because she's just alone and yeah. nobody's there to see any of this it stuff. She, and, it shows that she cooks, but you don't ever know where the food comes from way up in that tower, but somehow she I know, it's, that's well, they sort of leave that up. But, but, you know, she's making these pies and she's investing in herself. She's painting, she's reading, she does exercising there's scenes where she's doing so many different things she doesn't have to do those things it's not like her mother is sitting there forcing her to do it and there's a checklist she's just doing it because she genuinely enjoys it and she's trying to make the best of her life well and the mother actually isn't there all that much she's the mother gone. doesn't even comment on it she doesn't say like oh you made pie like <laughs> no and oh, she's wow. she's doing- the mother's gone a lot doing whatever. She's yeah. alone quite a bit of the time. But then that song where she sings, When Will My Life Begin, is all about her. She wants to share it with somebody. She doesn't want to just do that forever. It's like, I'm doing all these things and... I have no one to share it with. I have no one to share it with. And I think that's kind of sweet too, that she she loves... You can just tell from the words in that song that she actually loves what she's doing. She's a little bit bored at doing it alone so, so much. But she's. you can tell she's just like, when is somebody going to enjoy this with me. I think that's sweet Mm -hmm. because she doesn't just do chores all day. She actually does activities and and learns new things. Yeah. It's creative and yeah, but there are a couple of cringe moments. So (laughs) now we can get to the cringe moments. (laughs) What were yours? She, she doesn't really stand up to her mom. She stands up to, to Flynn or Eugene, but she doesn't stand up to her even when she's obviously being evil. But I'm Rapunzel. Oh, come on! Enough of the lights, Rapunzel! You are not leaving this tower! Ever! Yeah. Kind of, in some ways, it doesn't really fit with her personality otherwise. Mm-hmm. Because she seems to be able to... It, they make it seem like she's just trying to see the good in this mother figure, but she doesn't see that she's not. Yeah, she sees character really, really amazingly well. She sees Eugene, who's a thief. She sees him for who he is. She sees all this tavern full of criminals. She sees this grumpy horse and she brings out the best in him. But somehow she doesn't see the character of her mother. And I think that is somewhat of a metaphor of how we might be in real life with people that are closest to us. We may not see those things. And that's that's kind of interesting. But it's disappointing that she put up with all of those things. And then it wasn't until the end that she actually kind of grew the courage to kind of like say, I'm not putting up with this anymore. Well, it's like she had to clearly see what, what this mother was, that she wasn't yeah. ever really her mother. She had to see it. And it took a while for her to see it. What was what was a cringe moment for you? I know we had some similar ones. You know, I can't really find hardly anything in the movie. Fascinating womanhood, I should say. Like we're talking about fascinating womanhood and like there's things in the movie that I don't like, but they don't really have anything to do with fascinating women. <laughs> but as far like as women, sniffing like a dog and stuff like that. Because there's things in the movie that irritate me and stuff, but, and it's kind of, I won't get into the things that <laughs> irritate me about the movie in general. Maybe it's because I've seen it so many times, but I, I, from a fascinating womanhood perspective and just from the perspective of feminism, the feminist message out there, I just despise the literal last sentence of the movie where they, uh, the Eugene's voice says, did Rapunzel and I ever get married? Well, I'm pleased to tell you that after years and years of asking and asking and asking, I finally said yes. Eugene. I just, I just oh, feel like that. <laughs> it's supposed to be this like feminist joke at the end. And then she's like, Eugene. And he's like, all right, I asked her. And it's just like, he wanted to make it look like she was the boss all of a sudden. I don't yeah, know why they so- did that. Why did they do that? And, and, and it wasn't true to that period of time anyway. So It wasn't true to the period. It didn't match their relationship in general. It didn't, it didn't match the personality. It didn't match anything. It was like Disney was like, ooh, we got to throw in a little like jab in there at the end. And I just, yeah, I didn't like sometimes that. I just walk out of the room when the end comes on because I'm like, oh, I hate this scene. <laughs> I don't like it. I know. It, it doesn't fit. It's like they just tossed it in there. But. I mean, there's nothing wrong with women proposing to men. If that's what you want to do, I'm sure there's marriages out there where that's worked. It's not necessarily something I believe in, but I know people that it's worked. But I generally just in fascinating women, we just, that's not the message. I, well, I'm glad when, when Bob uh, proposed to me, he, we were lying on the beach in Santa Barbara. That's where we got engaged in he leaned over and said, he loved me. And he said, I think we should get married. And then he said, but I need to actually propose. Otherwise our whole life, you'll say I didn't actually propose. And so I'm glad that we didn't leave it with him saying, yeah, we should get married. 
I'm glad he actually did ask because uh, over the course of your life, I'm glad that I didn't ask him. And that's my, what my legacy is. In general, I think a lot of women want to be asked. And especially when you're talking about the feminine woman, that's really mm -hmm. the audience that we're talking to the woman that wants to embrace her femininity and traditional roles and masculinity and femininity working together. Usually that, usually that scenario is going to come with a man proposing to the woman. And then you couple that with Disney and that she's a princess. It just, it makes sense that the man. Well, the thing is there's, there's real power in feminine woman. It's not putting us beneath. There's actual real power behind being a feminine woman more than most women have any idea. It's, it's done out of respect. It isn't done out of, out of like you're beneath me or can't do anything yourself. It's respect. And it's respect that we supposedly have earned from our relationship with them that they ask us. Well, and especially too, the fact that in that movie, he's a, he's a wanted criminal and it's kind of fantastic that the king and queen would allow him to marry their daughter. And that's probably just the Disney part that we just have to ignore. But then you couple that with that she proposes to him. And I think they were trying to make a sarcastic joke about their difference, like their, but I just didn't care for it. It didn't really fit with their personalities, but whatever, that's what they did. Maybe yeah. Yeah, someone out there did, thought it was cute, but I just didn't think it was cute. <laughs> no, I didn't either. Okay, so that's all we had for Tangled. Uh, <laughs> hope you all enjoyed it. And again, if you haven't read our books and you're not sure about these principles or you want to learn a little bit more, you definitely have to read our books. They're all attached to this video. We are also on Instagram, Facebook, all the places on social media are attached to this video. You should definitely join those forums where you can ask questions and connect with like-minded ladies. And we are here on YouTube every single week. Don't forget to subscribe and hit like on this video to help our channel grow. If you have another suggestion for a video, drop that down below too. I know we're covering as many Disney movies as we can. I think we're going to do Aladdin next and hopefully Sleeping Beauty and Snow White are coming next. So if there are any others outside of those that you want to see. Yeah, Sleeping Beauty is my favorite. But that's all we have for today. And um, okay. thanks so much for, for being here with us, Mom. Oh, thanks for, thanks for doing this. I think this is fun. And if you hadn't been, had your little girl stuck in bed or on the couch being sick, you might not have watched them so many times and given us yeah. a Yeah, we'll see you guys next time. Okay. Bye. Bye.